King Comforter, Spirit of Truth who is everywhere, filling everything, treasury of every good, giver of life, come, abide in us, save us, soul, body, and mind, we pray. The entire unity of the human person includes the body. Now, for those of you who thought Christianity wasn't all that important in America, now that it is gone, do you see the difference? There is no such thing as a vacuum in our spiritual life. Either Christ is filling us, or the devil takes a hold of that vacuum and fills it up. Remember what Jesus said, if you get rid of one devil, maybe you got saved long ago, but you're careless, get back into your old habits, seven more worse devils will come in. He's not exaggerating. Mary Magdalene, as holy as she was after she was delivered, she had seven demons. It was a horrible burden to bear. We are not meant for evil, we are meant for good. And the goodness is revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ as God. He was before the ages, the Logos, and is. And he joined our human nature through the Holy Virgin Mary in an ineffable mystery. We don't understand how. All we know is that he took flesh from her alone because there was a virgin birth. There was no man involved in the conception of Christ. Important because, as we've mentioned before, the male seed from old Adam carries mortality and corruption with it. The whole coming of Christ is to release us from sin, which brings that mortality. And instead, he gives us immortality, which we were meant to have. It's a gift from God, but we were created, not just for a little short life like here. As the fathers say, this is the testing ground. This is where all the battles are. And then the rewards are for eternity, which is what we were created to live in. The kingdom of God extends from here as we join Christ and all of the holy angels and saints, extending into eternal life, where the sound of rejoicing is forever and ever. May we all be there, we pray, safe in Christ through the prayers of the saints. This world now is without a good Christian testimony. The Orthodox are still kind of in their enclaves. You have to go and knock on the door, ask them to teach you. And we have many things online. This one is the one I'm using today, Augustine, as uh, explained from an Orthodox Christian perspective by Archbishop Gregory and uh, uh, Reverend Michael Oskul, an expert in the Gnostic and pagan ideas that pre were precursors to the Christian. Now we Now we see St. Paul in the Agora, the marketplace of the Greeks in Athens, and that's where everyone gathered to hear new things, hear different philosophies. Their minds were attuned to this. M many were trained in the Socratic method. They would ask questions and people would come up with answers. So St. Paul had everyone at nonplussed because he was teaching a very interesting thing. 
the pagan life, the pagan idea, had no place really for the sanctity or holiness of the body. The body was a glove, and you threw it away at death, and your spirit was free. How many people think that? Because we are in a pagan time again. We reverted to this. So you have, first of all, signs of paganism, the glorification of self, the ego. Augustine brought back the idea that we are all evil when we were born. In pagan philosophies, they would find a way to make everything evil. And this kind of a Christian way, Augustine used since he was kind of semi-Christian. Uh, he did not study under Ambrose uh, about the same time as Ambrose. He was baptized by St. Ambrose in Milan. He did not continue studies. He went back to North Africa to his philosopher friends, Neoplatonists, pagan. So he had to make it understandable. So he said original sin, the sin of Adam and Eve, we are all born with, yes, it's true, mortality and, and corruption. But he said guilt, as if I myself chose against God. As a little preborn baby, I am born guilty? What a monstrosity of an idea. It makes God into a horrible person, judging me for the sin of someone else. This is never in scripture. I am under the weight of my own sin. It's bad enough. And you can make all sorts of things about the sins of my father and all the Old Testament, thank you. We're in the New Testament where Christ comes to reveal the truth about God and about the Old Testament. So let's go to the New Testament first, learn Christ well. And then we're able to go back and understand something about the old. So one of the signs of paganism in our society is the bloated ego. The idea of myself being so great and wonderful. No, we're pretty much all sinners. I'm sorry, but we are bound by our passions if you let them go in your ego to go after all the wrong things. Love, first of all, in all the wrong places. Food, anything else that can take the place of my emptiness. When I don't have God living within me, which is what I was created to have. Christ into my heart, ask Christ to send from the Father, the Holy Spirit. That completes me, then I have a head to lift up and look to God. And Christ will come and indwell through the Holy Spirit. But no, we haven't chosen that. Many of the children don't know it. All they know is the con men that are dis disguised as Christians who want your money and you, they want uh, uh, your tithe, whatever else, they want you to buy their books, most of which are emptiness, thought up, made up their own ideas. And we talk about this in um, the false gospels, that heretics, which means people who depart from the teachings of the apostles, explaining the scriptures. So we're caught up in ego, and we have all the superstitions attending because we don't believe in God's wonderful love for me and the providence he has 
for my life. So I have to do things a certain way or something will go wrong. I have to do something three times, knock on wood, all this stuff's coming back. Magic words, use scripture, not with faith, but just when I say it, it has to happen. That's another perversion of the Christian gospel. And you can find a verse for everything in the scriptures, unless you have the whole of the scriptural gospel, the revelation of Christ's salvation, we will have great giant missing pieces and we'll try and fill it in with our superstitions. We have abortion. I can't even think about it. It's so horrendous. I always wanted more children. The Lord only gave me two, but that was enough, of course, for what I had to do in life. But that someone would take a precious darling angel from heaven in the flesh coming to me and to my husband. What are we turning into, monsters? Yes. Without Christ, we'll be like the pagans who left children out to starve to death because they didn't want any more children. Or worse, they would have abortions too. There were things you could take in the old days. And the pagans did this. Are you happy that you're living that kind of horrible death-filled life? No, I don't think so. No, no. And in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, St. Paul warns against all of these abuses of the body. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit, he will tell us over and over. If you have Christ, of course, dear ones, if you are a Christian, you become not a temple for this evil stuff, sinning against the body and others, entrapping them into this sin, addictions of some kind or other. He will let it all wash away as we are baptized the baptismal trough is ready out there. The water is warm, as we say. Come, be baptized. Nothing is holding you back but your will, your choices. Wash away everything and be taught the holy faith from the apostles. So the body will fail you as a god, like every other god, yoga. The Catholic Church is such a failure in teaching Christianity. I have to ask the question, is the Pope Christian? Out in the missionary field, like I am, in the last two days I've met Catholics again and had good discussions with them. And something is stopping them from any other investigation into Christianity. They think, they've been told, the Pope is it. The Pope is the highest Christian in the land. Well, if he is, why doesn't he read scripture? Why is he quoting the latest Marxist quote from the EU? Why is he teaching that message, just repeating it, like the appointee of Charlemagne's EU? Why is he doing that instead of quoting scripture? Because he doesn't have scripture. You see, this is why the Pope cannot be Christian. 
the Holy Scriptures forms the foundation of the Christian Church. If you think that Peter, and you want everybody to believe that Peter is the only apostle upon which Christ said, Thou art Peter and I will build my church on you. If you believe that, first of all, you don't know the Greek. It doesn't say you, meaning Peter. It says, on this faith, it's feminine. I will build my church upon what you said, not who you are. So Matthew 16 to 18. We have the Lord saying to Peter, Thou art Peter, because of what you said. And upon this rock of what you said, I will build my church. That's what each of us says. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Ah, upon this I will build my church. You say, how do you know this? Because five verses later, read down in that same chapter, he said, Peter says to the Lord, you don't need to go through the cross. I know best because you already called me important. So as an important person, I will tell you, who are God in the flesh, of course, I will tell you not to go on the cross. You could do it without the cross. What was the Lord's response to Peter for what he said then? Get thee behind me, Satan. So, Mr. Pope, does that mean Peter is one time the head of the church, then he becomes Satan? Now Satan is supposed to be the head of the church? People, you're smarter than this. Read your scripture. That's why the Pope is not Christian. He doesn't want you to read that. He will never give you that verse. In fact, you will be told, as we were in the 1950s, let the clergy read the scriptures. It can be a snare for you. It's on the index of forbidden books. Yeah. You were sent to the fire of the holy so-called inquisition if you read scripture. Do you know why? In the New Testament, who was the greatest writer? Oh, where's Peter? There are two books and wonderful letters. They are from St. Peter. Uh, another letter from Jude. Several other. St. John, life-giving, because he was the beloved. He knew so much more. If you can't love your neighbor, you are a liar when you say you love God. Loving your neighbor is telling the truth to that neighbor, not lying. So that's what we're doing with you, telling you the truth. As to Holy Scripture, the church, the papal church, fails in its Christianity. It has no Christian message. The only message it has is the, has primacy over all other patriarchs. And the rest of the Orthodox world in the 900s said, uh, I don't think so. No man, no one man, has primacy. In fact, if someone claims this, they're called Antichrist, taking the place of Christ. No, we are under shepherds. Christ is the chief shepherd of the church in the Holy Spirit and the Father. So we have to say no the Pope is not Christian. I've had Catholics say, well, we're part of Christianity. Oh, can you find Peter and Christ saying you are the only head of the church? No. All of the apostles in their letters, especially St. Paul, Christ is the head of his church. Ephesians 5. Christ is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. The Pope isn't a bridegroom. He doesn't know anything. He needs salvation along with the rest of us. 
Do not rely, trust ye not in princes, Psalm 145, nor in the sons of men in whom there is no salvation. His spirit will go forth when he dies. He shall return into his dust. In that day all of his plans will perish. But blessed is he whose God is the Lord, the God of Jacob. He is the transcendent one and the one who became flesh to show us how to adore the Father and to adore him. Christ is one with the Father. Dear Protestant friends, now to address you. of the understanding of the person of Christ leaves you high and dry when you're explaining the passion, the cross, and the resurrection. I hear dear uh, Franklin Graham, he says, God sent his son to bear your sin, pay the price for your sin, whatever that means, and then God raises him from the dead by saying God sent him and God raises him, separating him from the person of Christ. God became flesh. He added our humanity to his Godhead. This is a mind blower, but it's true. That's how he did all of his miracles was as God through a human vessel of his flesh. When he rose from the dead, his own divine nature raised his body laying in the tomb and his soul which had gone down to Hades. So you see, it's one beautiful person born of the Virgin and fully God, fully man. That's why you and I are resurrected in him, in our human nature. Otherwise, it would be too high for us. In the Holy Eucharist, he reaches forth with his own human nature deified. And we partake of that human nature deified, the resurrected Christ. Not the dead Christ as you read in oh, horrible medieval tomes that say we're crunching on the body of Christ. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. In fact, Justin, the theologian in the first century, Justin Martyr, says to his pagan emperor that he's writing about Christianity to, he says, how could we be cannibals? We don't eat flesh. How could we do that? We can't. We are wonderful partakers of the risen Christ with the deified energies flowing out of his body and his blood. Loving your neighbor is telling the truth to that neighbor, not lying. So that's what we're doing with you. Telling you the truth. As to Holy Scripture, the church, the papal church, fails in its Christianity. It has no Christian message. The only message it has is the Pope is primary, has primacy over all other patriarchs. And the rest of the Orthodox world in the 900s said, uh, I don't think so. No man, no one man, has primacy. In fact, if someone claims this, they're called Antichrist, taking the place of Christ. No, we are under shepherds. Christ is the chief shepherd of the church. 
in the Holy Spirit and the Father. So we have to say, no, the Pope is not Christian. I've had Catholics say, well, what part of Christianity? Oh, can you find Peter and Christ saying you are the only head of the church? No. All of the apostles in their letters, especially St. Paul, Christ is the head of his church. Ephesians 5. Christ is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. The Pope isn't a bridegroom. He doesn't know anything. He needs salvation along with the rest of us. God became flesh. He added our humanity to his Godhead. This is a mind blower, but it's true. That's how he did all of his miracles was as God, through a human vessel of his flesh. When he rose, from the dead, his own divine nature raised his body laying in the tomb and his soul which had gone down to Hades. So you see it's one beautiful person born of the Virgin and fully God, fully man. That's why you and I are resurrected in him, in our human nature. Otherwise it would be too high for us. In the Holy Eucharist, he reaches forth with his own human nature deified, and we partake of that human nature, deified, the resurrected Christ, not the dead Christ as you read in, oh, horrible medieval tomes that say we're crunching on the body of Christ. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. In fact, Justin, the theologian in the first century, Justin Martyr, says to his pagan emperor that he's writing about Christianity to, he says, how could we be cannibals? We don't eat flesh. How could we do that? We can't. We are wonderful partakers of the risen Christ with the deified energies flowing out of his body and his blood. Without getting into more of that, I can say to the Protestants, come into the fullness of the understanding of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Don't be like my seminary professor that sa said when someone asked him, who is Christ? Is he God? Is he man? He said, the professor said in an astonishing Nestorian way, as a heresy, he said, Jesus Christ is a spirit-filled man to the max. No. That would leave him without the Godhead. And Christ is fully God. He's not just a spirit-filled man. He is God, who gives us as God the Son, the Holy Spirit baptism, to empower us and to allow us to live the Christian life. That's why we can live the Beatitudes. Like my seminary friends, some of the professors used to say, we can't live that. We can't live the Beatitudes. Therefore, it's meant for the future age. Yeah, in your theology, not in the Holy Scriptures, the Lord has blessed are those, that means us now, who are persecuted for righteousness sake. That's not meant for the age to come. All of those beatitudes are meant for now. They allow us to have virtue, to come in to the kingdom of God and not be without bearing fruit. Those virtues are hard. But as St. Paul, we say with him, I live now, not I, but Christ in me. And that allows me to either live in the body or die in the body, whichever I am Christ's. And it's for your sake. Again, 1 Corinthians, but in so many other Philippians, Galatians, 
five, twenty, somewhere around there. Dear ones, we are living in pagan times. Don't make God into your own image. Don't make up things. Go to the Holy Orthodox commentaries from the apostles passed down. We have Mother Miriam and uh, Archbishop Gregory's wonderful uh, uh, volume one and two of the New Testament, the Gospel and the Epistles with the Book of Revelation and the Acts of the Apostles. Each book with a wonderful commentary on most of the major verses. I will give the address down below here. Please avail yourself of this while it is available. And in the meantime, you've got online sources. Your big problem with being online, and I know because I've been searching for a quick, sometimes I look up something, just to have it quickly in hand, are getting to the Catholic who take their commentaries, who know nothing of them, and pretend like this is the only commentary. Go to orthodoxwiki.org, I think it's .org, Orthodox, put Orthodox commentaries, put it in front of commentaries, on such and such a book and verse, and you'll get them. I think it's pretty quick that way, rather than having to get a whole volume. But I so recommend having that volume. You can pass it down to your children. It just is a treasure trove of the Church Fathers. You don't have to have stacks of the Fathers' uh, tomes behind you you know, in the library. Uh, it would take two libraries, probably. However, Father Michael Oskell does have libraries full of patristic. That's what makes him such an expert. And he will give you the main problems of Augustine. Let's talk about those. Then we have that marvelous thing that's gone out of fashion, thankfully, predestination. That's what made the Puritans so warm and fuzzy toward others. If you weren't predestined, they could tell. If you weren't predestined for heaven, you were headed for hell. And they treated you exactly like that. That finally, some of them had some light. Jonathan Edwards was the worst of them. And I still had people that are enemies of Christ use that as an excuse. Jonathan Edwards scaring everybody into hell. So those are the major things I'm talking about. Besides the fact that, of course, Christ could not take flesh if there's original sin polluting every human being. How could Christ take flesh? The all-holy Logos, Word of God. How could he take flesh from the Virgin if she was indeed, like Augustine says, part of the original sin? Well, the Catholic Church made up a doctrine of Immaculate Conception, which supposedly in their minds made it possible, but it was artificial. They made it up. Not only that, they made a poor girl in Lourdes, St. Bernadette, so-called, see the Virgin in her demented, she was mentally ill, in her so-called vision of the Virgin. Guess what the Virgin told? Little peasant girl, Bernadette. Je suis l'Immaculée Conception. I am the Immaculate Conception. Voila, the rubber stamp on what the Pope had proclaimed as a dogma just a few years before, maybe even not that long. And once you have a vision, that's it. In the Catholic Church, all you need is a vision to make it true, not the scriptures, not any doctrine from the councils before or the apostles. 
So people, what we have in America is a mishmash of Catholic propaganda about the Pope being prime, the prime uh, leader among apostles, and infallible, and obviously that's not true, just take a look, and giving all sorts of grief to priests, making them take a vow of celibacy when they're not called to that. The early canon said that parish priests are to be married. God will rescue us. We have the holy orthodox faith coming in through the Russian people, through the uh, Serbian people, through the Antiochians, there are some good, through the orthodox Christians in America, OCA church. If you want to look for a church, we may help you in your area, in our area, you're certainly welcome to come and join us. We're very small, but we are careful with what we teach, and we will baptize you by immersion. This is very important. The entire baptismal service. May you live in interesting times is a statement generally held to be a mild curse. However, St. John of Damascus lived in such times. He is one of the great church fathers and lived in an era when orthodox doctrine was maturing, even as it confronted challenges from both inside and outside the church. One external challenge came through the rise of Islam. With St. John becoming the first Christian writer to approach the new faith from Arabia in a systematic manner. He defended the divinity of Christ against the claims of Islam and the veneration of holy icons against attacks both from Islam as well as from within the Christian community. Born around 675 AD, he came from a long aristocratic line in Damascus. Both his father and grandfather had been protosimvuli, or chief financial officers in the Christian Roman administration of this illustrious city, the jewel of the eastern part of the empire. In order to understand the importance of St. John of Damascus, we must go back a couple of generations to mid-April 634. The Christian Roman Empire of the East had been exhausted by a 20-year-long conflict with Persia. Both sides were severely weakened. In the meantime, a new power had arisen in Arabia 
which had racked up a series of rapid and impressive victories in the East. This was the Army of Islam. The Prophet Muhammad had died, but the military advances continued. The Islamic armies set siege to Damascus and nearly starved the city. At the helm of the Muslims was a ferocious warrior named Khalid ibn al-Walid, who had gained a reputation living in the monastery of Mar Saba near Jerusalem, which was now under the Muslim Umayyad rule, remained out of Leo's reach. He was able to write freely and proceeded to produce three powerful theological treatises in defense of the veneration of holy icons. He centered his argument against the charge that veneration of images is idolatry, on the idea that they provide affirmation of the incarnation of God. Of old God, the incorporeal and uncircumscribed was not depicted at all. But now that God has appeared in the flesh and lived among men, I make an image of God that can be seen. I do not worship matter. I worship the God of matter, who became matter for my sake and deigned to inhabit matter, who worked out my salvation through matter. I will not cease from honoring that matter which works for my salvation. I venerate it, though not as God. Emperor Leo's rejection of icons came against the larger backdrop of iconoclastic sentiment among both Jews and Muslims, who were also opposed to any depiction of God. Saint John, however, focuses on icons as a reminder of Christ's divinity, which is the central teaching of Orthodox Christianity. He notes that the veneration of holy images is a long-standing part of Christian tradition, and that the honor paid to icons is reverence offered to the prototype of the image rather than the image itself. He also points out that often when we do not have the passion of our Lord in mind, a picture brings it to mind and we fall down in worship of him. His major contribution to the Christian theological thought is his differentiation between veneration, proskinesis, and worship, latria, which were used interchangeably until this point. He points out that although both veneration and worship are offered to God, only veneration is offered to the saints and the holy icons. St. John's defense was brilliant, but it fanned the flames of the controversy in the Christian Empire. Intellectually, he won the day, and the advocates of iconoclasm had to seek other arguments. Yet the emperor was not easily deterred, so he aimed his vitriol at St. John against all logic. In an act of revenge against the saint, the emperor had a letter forged in St. John's hand in which he was supposedly offering his help, betraying the caliphate in favor of the Christian empire. The saint's biographers tell us that the ruse worked and that the angry Muslim potentate threw his former trusted counselor into a dungeon and had his right hand severed so that he may not be able to use it to write such letters again. Tradition has it that the Theotokos quickly restored the saint's hand, a miracle which caused the caliph to repent and release the saint from prison. This story is the origin of the holy icon of the three-handed Theotokos, as the grateful saint attached a silver image of his restored hand to his icon of the Virgin. Besides his theological prowess, St. John of Damascus is also reputed to have a beautiful singing voice, as well as the ability to compose music and write poetry. He composed hundreds of liturgical hymns, including the Paschal Canon, which is still widely used today. St. John of Damascus lived in the proverbial interesting times, 
but he is certainly one of the reasons which made those times so interesting. The Christian Church had flourished in the Roman Empire for three centuries by the time of the saint's birth, but it continued to be beset by doctrinal debates and disagreements. Although the ecumenical councils had made many definitive statements on belief, it was St. John of Damascus who wrote the first truly systematic philosophical treatise exposing the Orthodox Christian faith. St. John's excellent education and remarkable intelligence were tried and tested by the serious challenges of Islamic claims. As the successes of the Muslim armies and the rapid expansion of the Umayyad Empire, even into Damascus, proved to be far more dangerous to Christian fidelity than just as a mere heresy. St. John's theological prowess showed him to be uniquely qualified to speak and write in defense of the faith in Christ as God. Utilizing his knowledge of both Islamic and Christian beliefs and practices, he thus defended the Orthodox Christian faith heroically in the land of the Caliph. Likewise, St. John of Damascus stood up to the iconoclast emperor Leo III, defending the veneration of holy images as an affirmation of the incarnation of God in Jesus, the central doctrine of the Church, which distinguishes Christianity and sets it apart from other monotheistic religions of this time. St. John of Damascus feared neither caliph nor emperor in his devotion to Christ and the Orthodox faith. Continuing to write hymns and treatises, he spent the remaining years of his life in the monastery of Mar Saba near Jerusalem, where he surrendered his sanctified soul to the Lord on December 4th in the year 749 AD. His monastic cell, where he wrote his treatises, along with his grave, have been points of veneration for pilgrims visiting the monastery of Mar Saba since that time. St. John of Damascus, please pray for us that we may remain faithful to Christ as you did. Oh, no.